Today is Thursday, November 15, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Ted Zico. Welcome, Ted. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for coming. May I ask when you were born? March 4, 1933. And where were you born? Lyndon Morris Hospital in Natick. And uh, where do you currently live? Uh, Cape Cod, a sandwich mass. Okay. Your marital status? Uh, married. And do you have children? One daughter. Tell us what life was like in Natick growing up. The times in Natick were very happy times. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a young kid and moving around with other, you know, friends of yours uh, and uh, hanging out, in fact, in front of the library a lot. Mm -hmm. Used to get, uh, get kicked off the corner of the library at 9 o'clock at night <laughs> <laughs> because we were like loitering around at an mm -hmm. early age. But uh, we did a lot of different things. Played baseball primarily with Charlie Sticker, Pondy Tatooney, people mm -hmm. like that, Salvi Paranello. And we all went to the Lincoln School, which is down the street, and they tore down that school. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand you lived in Natick Center. What's that? I li I, that you lived in uh, Natick Center on Clarendon Street? Mm -hmm. Right, in back of the library. They mm -hmm. tore that house down, too. Okay. So you uh, obviously grew up, your childhood was spent during World War II. Tell us uh, what life was life was like then. Well, you're certainly engrossed in the war, and it mm -hmm. never really left you any day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, the day the war began, I remember the sirens went off, and the Congregational Church bells were ringing, and we thought it was going to be a celebration, but it wasn't a celebration. And I remember Peggy Sims was running down the street, where I lived at that time on School Street, mm -hmm. since we moved out of Clarendon Street, and she says, it's war. And she had three brothers who went into the military, mm. and of course people hang up the stars in the window. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the rationing began, gasoline was short, uh, butter was scarce, uh, cheese was almost impossible to get, and forget about getting chocolate. <laughs> and if, you wanted, if your mother wanted a big cake, she had a sort of safer rationing coupons in the book, or trade with neighbors, and then be able to have enough uh, coupons to go buy the sugar over at uh, I think it was McKinney's or mm -hmm. some store downtown in uh, Natick. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't get any chocolate for that matter either if you want to make a chocolate cake. So things were a little, a little tight, but we all uh, did well and uh, never did without. Okay. And you were telling me before the interview about a bond drive. Yeah, that was an interesting time in Natick. Across from the uh, funeral home that's adjacent to the common, they used to erect a large bandstand. And uh, celebrities like, I remember Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamour came for a bond drive and people would just buy bonds and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, kids were collecting scrap all over town to put in these uh, chicken wire fenced areas next to the Congregational Church and fill them up with scrap metal, mm -hmm. rubber tires. So environmentally, the, I think the town was pretty clean and you would mm -hmm. recycle any tin cans that you had. Your mm -hmm. parents would just flatten them out and they'd save them essentially recycling mm -hmm. at that time and dump them in the big uh, chicken wire enclosures next to the Congregational Church. So everyone had a, say, piece of the action. <laughs> and you had family members who took part in the war. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Well, I'm trying to think of how many I had. I believe seven cousins were primarily in the Army. One was in the Seabees, mm -hmm. and one was in the Marines. And I know he, for a fact, lost his arm at Okinawa. But uh, Zikos have always been in, in wars one or the other, mm -hmm. including you know uh, Vietnam and Korea. Okay. So you're telling me about the beginning of the war. How about the end of the war? Peggy Sims came running down the street. <laughs> I remember that emphatically. And she's saying, it's over, it's over. And the bells and the uh -huh. sirens were working and uh, you know, all over town. And, uh, and people were gathering on the common. Mm -hmm. Everyone went to the common. It seems to be a common meeting place for the people of the town. And they had just a joyous town, a joyous mm -hmm. time, you know. Okay. So now you're about 12 years old. Uh, where, what school you were, were you attending at the time? Uh, the Lincoln School. 
mm -hmm. which is down on uh, East Central Street. Uh huh. And I know that was um, that was actually the old high school, wasn't it? I and have no idea. I think it was the old high school, and then they built, rebuilt the Lincoln School a few years later. Yeah, I think I saw some photos in the library, yeah. and I realized okay. at that time it was the old high school. Okay. Yeah. And you did go to Natick High, mm -hmm. and what did you do there? I graduated in 1951, mm -hmm. and not much of anything. I really didn't have much direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the Korean War, of course, was going on in 1951, and didn't really have an inkling about the draft or whatever what it even was all about mm -hmm. until some people I knew went in, like Paul Eno. Yeah. I believe he left school and unfortunately I think he was killed in he Korea. He was, he was. In fact, the square is named after him over on, uh, right by Lincoln Square. Oh really? Yes. I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one person, I think it was, I don't know his first name, but his last name was Higgins. Mm -hmm. And he was wounded and he came back and he was a visual wound, you could actually see this fellow had a, something wrong with his arm, and, mm -hmm. uh, but those two I remember had gone in prior to my graduating from high school. Okay. Good. Uh, let's uh, get back to you. So you're, you're just out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, no college plans, were you drafted? Uh, no, I enlisted. You enlisted. And when, when was that? Uh, prior, a, little, a couple of weeks prior to December 15th, 1952. Mm -hmm. What were you doing in the meantime? I was a lab technician at Boston College. And what made you enlist? That's interesting. I was talking to professors at Boston College about college, and they put the, you know, the idea on my mind that maybe I, maybe I want to go to college. And I thought the only way I could really get into college was maybe join the military mm -hmm. and get the Korean bill. Plus it was a matter of patriotism too, the fact that you know the Cold War was on and that was always in the back of my mind. And, mm -hmm. But that wasn't really the, the driving force, it was the educational thing. And the fact that uh, I should maybe join the military that the service branch that I wanted mm -hmm. so no one would be shooting at me. <laughs> so I picked the Air Force, four <laughs> years. <laughs> Good choice. Uh, okay. <laughs> the best. And did any, um, anybody join the service the same time you did? Uh, at the time, I was not aware of uh, anyone. But mm -hmm. then, when I got the basic training, uh, there was Salvi Paranolo, uh, Charlie Behenna, Steve Zico, and then later on, my brother, older brother, joined the Army as a finance instructor. So there was another one after mm -hmm. the fact. But the others, I had no inkling whatsoever mm -hmm. that they were there, and I met them all at Samson. They obviously went at the same time I did. And Samson is Samson Air Force Base? Air Force Base, Base up in uh, Geneva Lake, uh, New York. It was a former CB uh, training mm -hmm. you know, base for the Navy in the Second World War. So tell us what basic was like. Cold. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> when you go up there in December, let's say we shipped out from Nevins Hall December 15th, about nine o'clock at night on a bus and went to North Station, got on a troop train, mm -hmm. which went all the way through New York, north, Albany and north, uh, picking up people, mm -hmm. Air Force people. And then I don't know what time the train dumped us off in the middle of this, what they called air base, because there was no airfield, no airplanes. It was just a big <laughs> freezing lake and a, a wasteland. <laughs> It was early in the morning, though, it's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they wouldn't give you a, 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 Christmas was coming on the 25th and the 15th. Say, you know, geez, can't we stay home for Christmas? No, no, we need you. So we all shipped out. Okay. <laughs> and did they need you for Christmas? No, we were, no, no, no. Well, we were up there at Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So aside from cold, uh, what was um, Air Force basic training like? Uh, it was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. You didn't do much of anything except take tests. And, uh, and until the spring came, we were freezing all the time because the mm -hmm. fires in the barracks, which were cold fires, always went out. And they would 
appoint someone like a fire guard to go stoke up the furnaces all the time, but he'd go to sleep and the fire would go out. <laughs> and that next morning he'd catch hell. But uh, there was a, lo a, lot of, a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did have a rifle range. We went on the rifle range a lot, but it wasn't like the Army. It's you know, like, like night and day. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is what you buy into. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uh, testing to determine what your specialties were and checking IQs and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I had choices I wanted. I wanted to be an aerial gunner and an, or an aerial radio operator. And then they posted all the information on the board after they took all these tests. And I'm looking for my name, aerial gunner, operator. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any such categories. Uh -huh. And I'm looking down, they see intelligence. I said, my intelligence? And I said, why, why intelligence? They said, well, your IQ, you'll do well. I said, well, I wasn't supposed to be that smart. <laughs> in high school, the teacher says, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to you in life. <laughs> I didn't get much support. <laughs> so I fooled them. Uh -huh. So I went to intelligence mm -hmm. and uh, I went to Lowry Field by plane, my first flight from Logan Airport to uh, Lowry Field in Colorado. Where I went to intelligence school, phone interpretation, and among other things. Mm -hmm. And I was there for a couple of months. That was like in uh, March, say March, April, I think. February, mm -hmm. February, and late March, early April, I shipped out on the SS Morton from Oakland, Army Base in California, for Japan. Okay, you mentioned interpretation. Uh, I take it then you were learning a language. Well, it was the Albanian language. This came later. Oh. Because Turkish, a lot of Turks speak Albanian. Ah, okay. That was the connection. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, say, okay, you're heading to Japan, but you were learning Albanians. Mm -hmm. Well, my first assignment mm -hmm. was uh, to be stationed to Japan, and mm -hmm. I reported in. And of course, in the Air Force, you don't tr uh, travel in units. Mm -hmm. You travel as an individual, and they put you in certain places where they need you. And I was placed within this target intelligence center of about seven people. Mm -hmm. and, what, and looking back in retrospect, they all spoke foreign languages, and they were all foreign nationals. Well, that told you something. And so we basically did targeting of uh, various uh, targets in the uh, Far East and Russia, mm -hmm. you know, the, the communist countries, including atomic weapons. We targeted, uh, found targets for atomic weapons. Mm -hmm. So that was the, that came, a lot of that was done later. But initially, early on in May, uh, I think, in, Prior to May in '53, mm -hmm. they were—I think they had the peace talks in Penmujan in '53, mm -hmm. and the peace treaty was signed in July. But prior to that, the North Koreans kept on breaking the peace treaty. They felt they wanted to get a little more, a better position to negotiate more mm -hmm. land, like type of thing. Right. And the only thing blocking them up on the DMZ was this Turkish battalion. Of, of I don't know how many, 900 men, 900. And I was sent up there to be a forward observer. In other words, if they were to be attacked, I was on a different hill than they were. Mm -hmm. They were on a couple of different hills. I was a distance away, but they caught the brunt of everything. Uh, the Chinese broke the treaty several times, and this time they wanted to break through their lines to get on the other side to get to this particular highway, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think that was around there, which was a strategic piece of land. And the Turks were sent up there to block their, their movement. And so I think there was, I think it was end of May, the months of May 1953, that there was a big scale attack by the, uh, the uh, communists, the Koreans and try to break through the lines, and it was like a pitch battle type of thing, and I was calling in air strikes from another hill, and I was with another, uh, with a Turkish officer who spoke Albanian, 
and directing fire on the Koreans that were coming over the hill like, like flies, you know. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't kill enough of them. Wow. So I didn't pull the trigger, but I sort of told them where to drop it. Mm -hmm. And the aircraft were flying overhead, P-51 Mustangs dropping an napalm and other munitions. And then had the old World War II, I think, Corsairs. Mm -hmm. They were dropping munitions on the lines and everything. But uh, eventually the Koreans did break through the Turks' line, and I believe they lost about 900 men. I believe they lost about 900. And they, I think they killed 2,000 Koreans. Wow. Yeah, so it was a pretty smoky place. So and how, what, uh, what was it like dealing with Turks? Turkish oh, Army. nice. Nice? Oh, mm -hmm. nice, tough people, yeah. <laughs> like the party. <laughs> mm. Party and kill people. Yeah. So even though you initially got into the Air Force yeah, to right. kind of avoid this kind of thing, yeah, right. you, got, you yeah. found yourself right in the middle of it help. anyway. Exactly, yeah. What was that like for you anyway? I didn't have time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Just you know, there to do the job and you know, even at a young age you have responsibilities mm -hmm. and you do what has to be done. Yeah, I wouldn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. And that was like the two days through three days and after that it was all over. Mm -hmm. And then they went back and they to the table I believe and the peace treaty was signed in July of 53. And then I came back to Japan mm -hmm. to my regular job. <clears throat> Basically, uh, and this is all declassified now, it was by mm -hmm. 1970 it was all declassified. And uh, trying to we were targeting various uh, communist country installations, airfields, Sakhalin Island, Vladivostok, mm -hmm. uh, up in Siberia. And we had the aircraft on our base that, like our reconnaissance bombers, B 47s. Mm -hmm. Our B 47s were doing the flyovers of these countries. And U 2 flights existed from here and other bases. Mm -hmm. and they would bring the photos back and we would look at them and decide what particular thing was you know, the targets and decide what sort of weaponry was required to destroy the particular targets. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, none of that occurred. They mm -hmm. had used that information. Now, uh, what was your rank at the time? I was uh, a sergeant. I just got to be mm -hmm. a sergeant, yeah. And do you think that you were adequately trained or well, that's hard to say. I had nothing to compare it to. Right. But wherever, whatever job I had to do, mm -hmm. it was done well because uh, the medals I received and accommodations you know, mm -hmm. accounted for that. So I think I was adequately mm -hmm. trained, yeah. Okay, let's get back to Japan. Oh, yeah. So uh, how long were you stationed in Japan? I left Japan in 1950... 55. 55, I believe, 55, September, no, 54, September 1954. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was Japan itself like at that time? Well, that's a good, you know, I'd gone to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and mm -hmm. seen the destruction and things there, and things were still, it was like ancient, it was like ancient. And the only thing running were the uh, railroads, the roads are, mm -hmm sometimes impassable. You go to downtown Tokyo and it's like flattened. I mean, look at it today. I mean, it's unbelievable <laughs> from what I see. I've never been back, but you could stand on top of the hood of a truck and look right across the whole city of Tokyo and see the other side. Uh -huh. But now it was entirely different. The countryside mm -hmm. is beautiful. The people were very nice, but very elusive. You know, they were, because they were told stories that we would eat them, you know. Americans would eat you alive. Ew. <laughs> can, yeah, cannibalistic. And uh, so you had to work around that. Mm -hmm. But we had people on our base who were Japanese who used to work there for the Japanese Imperial Air Army who ran the base. It was used to be a former mm -hmm. Japanese air base, uh, Imperial Air Base. And some of the people who worked for us used to work for them. Mm -hmm. So that was... Uh, but they were very fine people. I liked them a lot. Mm -hmm. Used to do a lot of things, and they were hurting for food, and 
we used to swipe stuff from the mess hall, like oranges and anything mm -hmm. that was edible, and go downtown and give it to the kids. To have you tell a bit of a story behind some of these photos. Oh yeah, this uh, photo is uh, taken out, taken at Mount Mataki. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a weekend and I was with uh, Charlie Behenna. I graduated okay. with him. You can show that to the camera? Yeah. I graduated with Charlie Behenna from mm -hmm. Natick High School. And he was in the photo lab of one of the reconnaissance groups that developed the films. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent some time together, but then we each went our separate ways mm -hmm. after a while. And did, um, have you been in touch with Charlie since? No, none of the people I was knew at the time. Uh, he was the only one that actually served with or on the same area geographically. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And could you spell Charlie's last name, please? I th B A H A N A. Okay. And this uh, this is an interesting. Uh, oh, photo. this one. Yeah. This is interesting. This is when I had some free time. I was recruited uh, by a friend of mine who had been, uh, he played triple A baseball at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said they needed someone to play left field for the Okoto Raiders. Mm -hmm. And I never even played sports in high school, but I was good at what I did. And so we had a winning team. Uh, we were second in the Far East uh, Tournament. Mm -hmm. that was, you know, the Army, all the military services had uh, their own teams. I played left field. And interesting enough, the only two, or well, actually three, African Americans I ever met were on this team. Really? One was the coach, mm -hmm. and one was the other black player who played first base. And only one other time in the military had I ever come across. Uh, African American person. Yet the army, the military had been integrated after the end of the Second World War, but I had not seen it. Really? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now you're, uh, you're still in Japan and you've been in uh, Japan until 1955? I'm just trying to think. 50, I, sh I mm -hmm. came home in 1950. Shipped out in September of 55. Yep. S September uh, 55. Okay. And what happened after that? Uh, I came to South Carolina mm -hmm. and got bored. <laughs> and. You were still in the Air Force. Still in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I got bored. And I was actually assigned to a, uh, a thing that had nothing to do with my specialty. But then I had an opportunity to play tennis on an all Air Force tennis team. And so I took up that opportunity. So that took up most of my time, remaining time in the military. I played tennis. You played tennis. Yeah. So I had a real good time, went a lot of places, mm -hmm. uh, primarily in the southeast part of the country, and played colleges, universities, other military teams, mm -hmm. and uh, had a real good time. And I take it you never had played tennis before? Oh, yeah, I've always played tennis. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. ever since I was maybe in my teens, All even right. in high school, mm -hmm. I played tennis. But Natick High School didn't have a tennis team or anything like uh, that. Ah, okay. And then, uh, an interesting thing, I had been influenced by this African-American fellow that I had met in, uh, on the base in Japan who was a college graduate. In fact, all the people I was with, they were all college graduates. And so he in particular influenced me to go to college mm -hmm. after the military. So I applied for an early release, which I got. I got out in uh, August, sometime 15th or 16th of 1956, mm -hmm. and five days later, I was in class at Boston University. Well, it didn't take much time in there, mm -hmm. <laughs> like rolling from one to the other. And what were you majoring in at BU? I was majoring in uh, public and business relations. 
I graduated in uh, 1960. And what you do after that? I went to work for General Motors. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I went to business myself as a consultant. And I've now been retired uh, 10 years. Looking back, do you um, believe that you did some good for your country while you were in the Air Force? Yeah, I think I did. Okay. I think it was a responsible thing that I did. Gave, I think, the people at the bargaining table at Pyongyang a little more leverage, you know, mm -hmm. twisting the arms of the North Koreans to sign a, well, actually it wasn't a peace treaty. I think they're still at war unless that's with South Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was an important thing. But whatever I did, I felt was important. Whether I'm not playing tennis or baseball, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have much choice, and no one really cared much mm. after that. As far as I was concerned, I wish they had maybe released me, say, we don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't to be. I'm just looking at the list of medals and commendations, and you re actually received a presidential unit citation from the Republic of Korea. Yeah. Tell us what that was for. Sigmund Rhee. That was for that escapade with the, the two or three days mm -hmm. uh, with the Turkish Brigade. I think they were in Mount, Mount Vegas or something. Mm -hmm. That was the name of the hill. And the uh, presidential unit citation had to do, and that was for like nine people. Mm -hmm. That was for two things, really. We were getting together photos of Jin Vim Pru at the time because the French were still in Indochina. And early on, the United States was getting involved in this thing. And I think at the bargaining table, I believe Eisenhower was the president at the time, but the negotiators in Paris uh, needed some leverage and the French said, well, why don't you Americans drop some light tactical atomic weapons around Jim Jim Pu and get rid of these people that are pressuring us to surrender because the, the uh, the uh, Viet Cong, mm -hmm. I think they're called the People's Liberation Army at the time, were digging trenches up to the lines and across the runways so the runways couldn't be used anymore. So uh, the French wanted the Americans to drop some atomic bombs. I think planes, the planes would come from the Philippines because in Japan you couldn't have any atomic weapons mm -mm. at all. And uh, the Eisenhower couldn't get like Great Britain or any of the other people to go along with that idea. So they put the gabosh on it, but we were ready to go with atomic weapons. So part of it was getting the strategy, the targets for the atomic weapons. That was part of my group's responsibility. So that's what we did. You just imagine if that had gone through. <laughs> that would have been all hell broken loose. <laughs> yeah. Because the Russians were flying over our mm -hmm. area in Japan as well, mm -hmm. you know, and we were flying over their areas, up in northern area, northern Japan, Hokkaido, up mm -hmm. in there. In fact, it shot down one or two of our aircraft mm -hmm. uh, for getting too close. Let's let's talk about uh, Vietnam for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, given that there was just a lot of what ifs that were. Uh, you just bounced off. Do you believe the United States should have gotten involved in Vietnam? I'm not that really informed mm. on that. I, mm. I can't answer that question. All right. Yeah. Well, what about um, those who fought in Vietnam? I think they were justified in doing what they did. Mm -hmm. And the way the Vietnam veterans were treated? When they got when they got back, I don't home. think too well. Yeah, too good. Too, good. Mm -hmm. too much was going on on the rumor mill as to what happened over there. Mm -hmm. But you know, the battle scene is a pretty tough place, and there's no time to be nice, mm -hmm. and you can't be nice and maybe be a survivor. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. So now you've retired. Uh, do you have? After you left the Air Force, did you uh, join any uh, organizations? Well, I was in the active reserve. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, inactive reserve inactive. for 12 years, and I didn't. I don't 
join organizations. Okay. I don't need any more military stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you did you married and you yep. had a child. Did your child ever um, express interest in joining the military? Oh no. 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 Mm -hmm. no. Neither was she encouraged. Okay. How important was it to you to serve in the military? In retrospect, uh, it was important for me because of uh, had never been away from home. Mm -hmm. You know, you were 19, and all you saw was maybe you went as far as Boston on a rare occasion, and you never knew what was over the hill. So I thought it was really a great awakening, and it was well worth, and I'd do it again. Okay. Yeah. Ted, is there anything else you'd like to say, um, say, relate? Is there another story that pops up into your mind about your military experience? Mm. I can only say that uh, the first night you're together with a bunch of you know, people from, and we had people from Ohio, not just New England, mm -hmm. but they were shipped in. And people like myself had never been away from home. So your beach basically gave uh, so each other support, and you work things out. Mm -hmm. And there were some people uh, that maybe were rather unsavory, who in the final analysis turned out to be people that you never realized were behind that facade of being, you know, real good people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So never had a, I don't think I've ever met anyone in the Air Force I didn't like, mm -hmm. really. A little naivety, but, you know. Okay. Let's uh, go back a little bit and talk about your cousins who served in World War II. Mm. Uh, do you remember their names? Oh, uh, yeah. Let me see if I can start with the Dennis Zico family. All righty. Uh, there was Peter. They called him Shorty. That's his nickname was Victor. Charlie. Beatry. B-I-E-T-R-E. -E, uh, it's another name for James, I guess. Ah, James. okay. Then there was Andrew Zico. That's another family now, John Zico's family. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Zico. And then the other brother, Christopher Zico, uh, his son's name was Thomas mm -hmm. Zico. And then there was a, they called him Bing Zico. He was a musician. Bing. Bing, yeah. okay. Yeah. Bing Zico. I forgot who his father was. Then there was James Zico, lived over here on South Avenue. And I don't think I've missed anyone. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. So they all served in World War II. Yeah. And right. one of them lost, uh, who, who was the James. one who lost? James. Yeah, was, and mm -hmm. he's since deceased. Mm -hmm. yeah. When they came back, did they talk about it, their experiences? Well, I never had that much association with them. Uh, they mm -hmm. were all started to do their own thing, you know, put their own lives together, starting up garages and repair shops and things. Mm -hmm. Never really, never talked about it at all. Other than I think James did. Mm -hmm. I remember going to his house one time because people asked him, how did you lose your arm? And then the story came out. But that's about it. Mm -hmm. And earlier in the interview, you mentioned uh, Paul Eno. Mm. Uh, what could you tell me about him? I just knew him from school. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very small fellow, and I believe he was a tanker. He was in a tank, but the small people in the tanks. Mm -hmm. And last thing I knew, he was uh, killed in Korea. But mm -hmm. he was uh, used to play ball with him, and he, was, he used to hang, hang around with everyone. Mm -hmm. He's a nice kid. I really liked him. Anything else? No, but I wish the rest of the people, that I, like, like John Carter and uh, mm -hmm. Charlie Bahena and Simon Paranello would come and you know, put their remarks down on the tape mm -hmm. here. Well, assuming they're still on this side of the planet. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ted Zico, it has been wonderful uh, to have you interview for us. Thank you for coming uh, for the Native Veterans Oral History Project. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.